And we now move on to questions to the Minister for Social Development. I can advise members that question six has been withdrawn. And I call Judith Cochran. Question number one, please. Thank the member for a question. The Housing Executive has advised me that, pursuant to your previous question on this matter, a further 46 homes in East Belfast have been converted to gas, leaving 664 homes that have Economy 7 oil or solid fuel heating still to be converted. Of these, a total of 358 are currently included in heating replacement schemes that are either ongoing or due to commence by April 2017. A further 181 homes have refused to have gas installed. The remaining properties are in two of the tower blocks, which the Housing Executive currently has no plans to convert to gas. I call Judith Cochran for supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Could the Minister provide an update um, on the policy um, that his department has in relation uh, to converting um, houses um, from oil heating when they are on the gas network? Uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, I can say that the uh, Housing Executive policy is to install gas heating in accordance with its programme in properties where gas is available and it is technically feasible to do so. I call Pat Sheehan. Uh, could, could the Minister tell us if the Housing Executive is working to a time frame to convert from the costly uh, and environmentally damaging electrical heating appliances to gas? Um, can I, in, in response to the member, can I say yes? It is the intention where this is doable, but it may not be practical in every instance. And not least, surprisingly, as uh, similar to the uh, supplementary that I questioned from the, the member and the answer, but rather some people, in particular elderly people, do not want changes in their home. They do not want the hassle. And so, therefore, there is no enforcement where a tenant that says, look, I would prefer just to carry on the way things are. But yes, it is the aim and objective to replace the, the economy setting. I call Gerard Diver. Mr Deputy Speaker, can I ask the Minister in relation to this matter, is there any plans or thought in this department about actually reducing the qualifying period that people would have to meet in order to have their heating upgraded to a, more, a modern system such as the modern gas system, given that this is a very clear way of taking people out of fuel poverty? Uh, Deputy Speaker, the member raises an interesting uh, question in relation to whether it is possible to reduce the the time. And there are no plans to do that at the moment. However, since he has now raised it, it is a matter that I will have a look at in the few days that I remain in the department. So therefore, and I do think it, it's something that should be looked at, and if it is practical to do that, then I can't see why it can't be done. But there will be still the restraints on, not least the financial restraints to do the whole thing. Can I remind members uh, that they should continue to stand uh, if they wish to continue to ask a question and, and be called? And I call Gordon Lyons. Mr Deputy Speaker, question number two. Deputy Speaker, the Housing Executive makes long-term investment in tenants' homes through planned programmes of work, including a number of different schemes aimed at preventing heat loss, improving energy efficiency and insulation. These include the upgrading of roof space insulation, the replacement of single glazed windows with double glazing and the replacement of old inefficient heating systems with modern fuel efficient boilers. Its external cyclic maintenance schemes cover any issues relating to the external fabric of the dwelling and where damp mould growth or condensation has been identified. This is addressed in this type of scheme. The response maintenance programme is also used to remedy immediate problems which may arise. In relation to new build social homes in the social housing development programme, 
The Department is currently considering if additional Housing Association grant funding should be provided for schemes where thermal efficiency exceeds current building regulation standards. Consultation is currently ongoing and a final decision is expected later this year. I call Gordon Lyons. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I uh, thank the Minister for his answer? And uh, can I also thank the, the Minister for uh, all the work he has carried out uh, in the Department since he has taken office? And I very much appreciate that he has taken the time to, to meet me uh, on a number of issues that I have brought to his attention, and insulation uh, is one of them. Um, Further to that, could the Minister uh, confirm if the findings of the Cavity Wall uh, Insulation Inspection Report uh, of 2014 by the South Eastern Regional College, whether uh, the findings of that report will be taken into account by the Northern Ireland Housing Executive? Deputy Speaker, yes, and I, I can confirm that, in fact, the member has been quite consistent and indeed persistent in relation to this issue. And I have met with him and discussed this in some detail. But can I say that the issues contained in the CERC NIHE report on cavity wall insulation are a UK wide issue, not unique to Northern Ireland? The Housing Executive has told me that it has no current plans to isolate the Pacific properties referred to within the report from the remainder of its stock. I wrote to the Housing Executive about this matter further on the 8th of February to ask how it will rectify the situation in the remaining homes. It is the Housing Executive's intention to bring forward programmes of work related to insulation for properties which have been identified by the recent stock condition survey as in most need and in line with asset management strategy. This work will require focusing on the significant number of properties which have to date not benefited from any insulation work. Furthermore, essentially the Housing Executive's view is that its limited resources available for investment should be determined by a strategic response to the formidable body of evidence that has been provided by a comprehensive survey of one quarter, around 22,000 that is, of, of all its homes rather than an issue specific report based on a sample of just 206 homes. I call Oliver Minister, there are many people across the north here who are living in, living in houses, both private and social, but which have little or no insulation, and that includes those in the rural areas. Can I ask what strategy your department has in dealing with this serious issue? Well, I take the point that the member has made, and could I just say that in the uh, joint DSD Housing Executive Asset Commission, has provided the housing executive with a comprehensive, robust data on the condition of its stock and a holistic understanding of its long-term future investments. It should also be said that in relation to, and I know you think you speak about the private sector here, but in relation to the private sector, there has been grants and there has been uh, funding made available to tackle this issue through the, for private landlords. And I would encourage private landlords, and I would ask every other assembly member here, to, to do likewise and make them available of uh, grant aid that is available and I think sometimes that it is that uh, there is not enough awareness around what exactly is made but I think that in the future uh, that may change and hopefully it will not be long until we see the whole housing stock whether it's in the private or, or social sector, and it has to be acknowledged that now the private sector renting is one of the major uh, landlords in Northern Ireland, and it's important that they are made available of any funding that is available to address the, the issue that you raised. Michael Robinson. Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Minister, schemes to replace windows, and I think if I pick you up right, there will be schemes to look at cavity wall insulation. Has the Minister any information or any intention to look at schemes to replace front and back doors? Because we are seeing homes now that are being improved for insulation purposes through cavity wall insulation, through windows, but the doors still remain a problem. Uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, thank the member for his question. And can I say yes, that there are in some areas where there are uh, schemes continuing, uh, being uptaken at the moment, to replace back and front doors. Now, if the member has, in fact, a particular area that he has a particular interest in, he can either let me know as I walk past him today or call in, and we will take a look and see, let him 
know where exactly that scheme is on, if it is at all, but certainly if uh, he talks to us about it, then there's a better chance that it's going to be on a scheme. Thank you. I call Stuart Dixon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your answers thus far. Clearly, you'd be aware that many members have been lobbied by the cavity wall insulation industry with regards to the failures of cavity wall insulation in a number of properties, particularly housing executive properties. Can the Minister explain to the House why, given the high failure rate of cavity wall insulation and the importance of cavity wall insulation in delivering appropriate warmth to homes, that the housing executive is not conducting camera inspections of such cavity wall Walls. Uh, I thank the member, uh, Deputy Speaker, for his uh, question. Uh, cavity wall insulation has been a, a subject that has been tossed around for quite some time now. Uh, but it has to be said that there has been what I call honest attempts uh, to, in fact, deliver on this particular matter. And there has been, in some cases, some issues with it. The, my department, with the Housing Executive, are looking at this and to see, in fact, just if there are a high list of deficiencies and where these deficiencies exist. Now, it should also be said that the Savile report, which has just been uh, published, has been a very comprehensive report uh, commissioned by the Housing Executive on all of its housing stock. And when this report has gone through in some detail, those are the very issues that we expect to be teased out and will leave the Housing Executive better placed in the future to tackle the issues that Mr Dixon raises. I call Andy Allen. Mr Deputy Speaker, question three, please. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, I thank the member for his question. In 2011, the waiting list for East Belfast stood at 2,125, of which 1,058 applicants were deemed to be in housing stress. The current waiting list for East Belfast stands at 1,661, of which 904 applicants are deemed to be in housing stress. Although this remains a challenge for the area, I am happy to advise that as part of the 2016-17-2018-19 Social Housing Development Programme, there are plans to deliver 311 new homes. The delivery of these new homes and the relating of existing stock, relating of existing stock will hopefully go some way to addressing the housing stress in East Belfast. The Housing Executive continues to keep housing <coughs> need under review and develop plans to help those in housing stress. I call Andy Allen. Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers. Um, can the Minister outline how many homes under the Social Housing Development Programme will be in East Belfast? Yes, uh, Deputy Speaker, the Housing Executive has plans to deliver 311 uh, new homes, new social start units across East Belfast over the next housing programme, which takes from 2016 to 2019. I call Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I uh, thank the Minister for authorising his officials to meet with me in relation to a Clan Mill housing shared neighbourhood development at the former Lisnashara High School site in East Belfast. But could I ask the Minister if he would be minded to support the inclusion of uh, mixed tenure and a small number of affordable homes in this particular development? Uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, yes, I can say to the Member that is something that I am prepared to look at and give consideration to. Uh, and with the, sh the short time that's left for me to be in post, then I'd need to be at it very soon. And I can give an understanding, an undertaking today that I will take a look at that and have listened carefully to what the member has suggested. Thank you. I call Rosie McCorley. I would ask McCorley. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I ask the minister if he could please give a breakdown of the East Belfast housing stress figure to council boundaries? so that this could accurately reflect where, uh, where housing stress lies, so that it could be more effectively dealt with? Uh, Deputy Speaker, no, uh, I don't have the figures in front of me in relation to the breakdown that the member has requested. However, it is something that we can take a look at following today's uh, question time. And if those figures are obtainable and can be extracted, then I will forward them on to the member. Uh, so she will see exactly where 
the, uh, the issues are in, in relation to the questions that she has asked. But I'm sorry, I don't have that information in front of me. I call Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, land acquisition uh, is one of the biggest obstacles identified by the Housing Federation in relation to uh, social housing you build. So could the Minister advise, uh, if possible, not just the land available uh, for social housing in East Belfast, but also if his department or indeed the housing executive is going to take strides to acquire land right across Belfast? Deputy Speaker, land acquisition has always been a major issue and it's one that doesn't be resolved very, very quickly because in my own constituency and in my own town where I live in Dungannon, uh, there are always these problems arising of where we can get land to do housing. But let it be said that the housing executive and those who are tasked with the job of identifying areas for build are pursuing these issues and trying to plan not just simply 12 months ahead but indeed years ahead so i can assure the member that is something that's very prevalent and ongoing within the department and within the housing in consultation with the housing executive um, but if she has uh, some suggestions in relation to her own constituency when she comes back after the election she might want to talk to the new minister about that then i call jim allister the uh, Deputy Speaker, the average and maximum levels of benefits protected each year by the planned mitigation measures as part of welfare reform are as follows. ESA time limit and average is £5,327 and the maximum is £5,327. The adult disability premium average is £3,640 and the maximum is £10,024. The disability protection average is £2,005 and the maximum is £7,287. The social sector size criteria average is £666 and the maximum is £1,200. The benefit cap is at, at £26,000. The, the average is £2,811 and the maximum is £14,340. In the CARES Alliance, the average is £2,564 and the maximum is £6,390. The maximum amounts for social sector size criteria, benefit cap and CARES Alliance have been based on an average of the top 10 highest benefit amounts protected under these schemes through the welfare reform mitigation measures. This is to protect the confidentiality of individual cases as the components that make up these benefit amounts will depend on individual circumstances. This is in accordance with the Code of Practice for Official Statistics from the UK Statistics Authority which states that official statistics must not reveal the identity of an individual or organisation or any private information relating to them. The benefit cap figure quoted is based on the £26,000 benefit cap and has been based around capping households on their entire universal credit award. Initially, the benefit cap award will apply to housing benefit before the introduction of universal the credit. Is up. Ultimately, the full universal credit award will be subject to the cap. I call Jim Allister. Uh, so just to focus on the welfare cap amongst that plethora of figures, what the Minister, I think, is saying is that there are at least 10 families uh, that he is protecting their benefits at a level above £40,000 a year because the average protection is 14 on top of the benefit cap. Is that correct, that there are multiple families of that order still receiving benefits in excess of £40,000? And is the minister comfortable with that? Does he think that's a good spend? Of public money? Um, Deputy Speaker, sometimes it's not a matter of what the Minister is comfortable with or what is not. It's what the Minister and what the Department and what the regulations clearly state that must happen. Um, and that's in, in regulations. And I don't often, indeed, ever have any uh, control over that. But in relation to the number of families that, that he speaks about, I will double check that for you. And, uh, because I, I know you'll be interested in having the exact detail, and I'll forward that to you. 
I call Paul Free. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, would he know how uh, much a working family would have to earn each year to bring their net income above the £26,000? Deputy Speaker, an annual net income of £26,000 per annum is equivalent to approximately £33,700 gross income per year. A call for Amakan. I'll ask Ken Corner. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And can the Minister say if he has met with the expert panel on welfare and if they are content with the mitigation measures? Uh, are content that they will help them uh, protect those most in need. Deputy Speaker, yes, I, <laughs> I have to assume, and I'd be bitterly disappointed, and I suspect this House and others would be, if the expert panel were not, because after all, it has been the expert panel that has been providing these figures for us and who have been doing the work, and they are, as we have already both uh, the questioner and myself have re referred to them. They are the experts, and uh, we, have to, we are led by them. And if it transpires later that, in fact, they are not confident, well, then I think that there would be questions that would have to be asked. But I am assured that they are. I call Patsy McLaurin. Gourmet, a good last year on Poor Legs. We have slash and error. Thanks very much, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister. Um, in, in light of recent announcements emanating from from GB, particularly around cuts to ESA and personal independence payment. Has there been any assessment or evaluation carried out or, or even um, connection made with the departments in GB to establish the consequential budgetary and indeed policy implications for welfare reform in Northern Ireland here? Uh, Deputy Speaker, can I say to the, uh, in response to the the member. The, the mitigation scheme is designed to provide financial support to claimants that are in receipt of benefits then when the welfare reforms are in, introduced. Furthermore, the introduction of time limited means that effective claimants will only be notified of the change a few months before their benefit is reduced or stopped altogether. So effectively the one year time limiting rule will be applied retrospectively. And anyone that claims benefit after the welfare reforms are introduced will be made aware of the conditions that apply to that benefit at the time of application. For employment and support allowance also claimants, this means they will be aware of the contribution-based element will only be paid for one year if they are in work-related activity. This means they will be aware of the impact a year in advance and will have time to prepare for the benefit season. I call Paul Gervin. Question number five. Deputy Speaker, I can advise that 248 new social housing units are planned to start in the Southampton parliamentary constituency area over the next two years. You will also be interested to note that so far in this financial year 2015-16, 74 new social housing units have been completed in Southampton with a further nine units nearing completion. Of course, you will be aware that programme schemes can be lost or slip to future programme years for a variety of reasons. Schemes can also be added to the social housing development programme through the annual Housing Association bidding round programme formulation process. Call Paul Gervin. Thank the Minister for his answer, and I, take, I want to take this opportunity to thank the Minister for uh, his help. Uh, during his short time in post, and I just uh, want to maybe uh, expand upon that. And could the minister give me a total projected housing need for South Antrim that the department hold in relation to the total housing need for South Antrim? Deputy Speaker, I, I can tell the member that the housing executive, as the arbiter uh, of housing need, determines how many new homes should be provided in any specific geographical area and programme schemes to meet the demand. The Housing Executive is working to address the housing stress levels in the South Antrim area in a number of ways. For example, housing stress is addressed most notably through the re-letting of existing stock, refurbishment of void properties and the allocation of new build schemes. The number of new social homes required is based on the annual housing need assessment, 
which examines the supply and demand, highlighting any areas where there are gaps and predicts what will be required over a five-year period to develop the social housing development programme. I call Daniel McCrossan. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, and uh, thank you to the Minister for his, his answer so far. Uh, the Minister will be aware that since 2010, only around 60 new social housing properties have been built in West Tyrone. This represents the lowest number of bills in any constituency across the North. Considering the massive waiting lists, with half of those in housing stress, would the Minister agree with me that it is time for action to deliver for these many people and families who are suffering across my constituency? Can I remind members that they should try to link their question to this uh, original constituency question about South Antrim? The Minister may or may not uh, be able to reply. Minister. Well, I know, I know South Antrim and West Tyrone is a wee bit apart, uh, but uh, that does not diminish in any way the, the member's concern because what applies in one part of the province very often is, is replicated in other parts of the province. In relation to what is happening in his constituency, I can tell him this, that this and this has not been glib about it, it is not a lot different uh, from other regions and other areas of Northern Ireland, where there is a housing stress and a housing need, and I acknowledge that there is in West Tyrone as there is in the one that we have just spoken about. And we do know that almost 50 per cent, if not even over it, right across Northern Ireland, of the applicants who are in for uh, housing, 50 per cent of them are housing stress. However, I think I should <coughs> share, share one statistic with the Assembly, which I find quite uh, difficult to understand when I investigate it further into this matter, that for you to be put on the housing stress list, you require just 30 points. So anything above 30 points, you are deemed to be in housing stress. And indeed, that is a matter, Deputy Speaker, that I want to have a look at to make sure that all those who are really in stress uh, and housing need, they are being given the, the consideration that they deserve. Question number six has been withdrawn. I call Phil Flanagan. Yes, a very short. Question number seven. Uh, Deputy Speaker, unfortunately, the information is not available in the format that the member has asked. I can, however, advise that a total of 47 social houses have been completed in the former Fermanagh District Council area in the 2015-16 financial year. These new homes were built in the Enniskillen area. I call Phil Flanagan. I thank the, the Minister for his answer, and I suppose there is no guys that you, you should never ask a question that you do not know the answer to. Uh, the question I had actually submitted was to ask the Minister how many questions have been started in the 15-16 financial year, and somehow it has changed. Uh, and, and what astounds me about the answer is that one social house in the whole county was started, a single uh, bespoke unit in Brookbra. But can I ask the Minister, following on from, from other questions, if he can give me an assurance that there is a commitment to actually build social houses in rural areas? Because the perception amongst rural dwellers is that there is no point adding your name onto the social housing waiting list because there is absolutely no expectation of houses being built in those rural communities. So I am looking for an, an, an assurance from the Minister the that those houses may be built Minister. in the future. Well, Deputy Speaker, I can give the member the assurance that there is no attempt uh, to leave County Fermanagh out of any future social housing development. But can I say this to him, which he might find useful, that there were 82 new social housing starts in Fermanagh District Council area, the former district Fermanagh area, during the period of between 2010-11 to 2014-15. Now, that equated to a total spend of £9.7 million, of which £4.9 million was Housing Association grant. And furthermore, can I tell him that the Housing Executive has identified a total projected housing need for the Fermanagh area to be 117 units in the period 14 to 2019, of which 100 units are identified for Enniskill and Town. Between April 16 and March 19, it is anticipated that a further 137 units will be delivered in Fermanagh and South Room Parliamentary constituency area. I hope he finds that useful. And that is the end of our period of listed questions to the Minister. And now we turn to topical questions. And I call Phil Flanagan.
I'll ask Kieran Corley, uh, and I thank the, the Minister for his, his very detailed answer. With regards to the proposed transfer of the site of the former Grosvenor Barracks in Enniskillen uh, to Fermanagh District Council, uh, which has been earmarked for the development of 200 social housing units, can the Minister indicate whether he supports that transfer out of his department to the local council, which then will actually remove it from the ability of social housing providers to develop on that site? Uh, Deputy Speaker, I can assure the member that I am not doing anything to obstruct or um, be awkward about the building of new homes in County Fermanagh. After all, and I'm sure the member has noticed it, I do represent Fermanagh South Throne in this, in this uh, assembly. And uh, as uh, an assembly member for that area, I'm sure it will come some comfort and relief to him that uh, very often his concerns about housing are my concerns. I call full standing in for supplementary. I thank the Minister for his attempt to, to answer the question. and I'll, I'll put him on notice that it wasn't him that initiated the process, but I'm looking for him to, to intervene now to stop it as a, a locally elected representative. Uh, Minister, there are um, 1,000 people roughly on the housing waiting list in Fermanagh, and nearly 300 of those are in stress. Um, and as Mrs Kelly indicated, land acquisition uh, is a significant issue for housing associations. So can the Minister indicate whether, in theory, he would be supportive of a 17.2-acre site being transferred out of his department and given to the local authority for them to decide whether to sell it in the open market or to do whatever they want and actually take it away from the, the housing association's ability to deliver on that site? Deputy Speaker, my task and my responsibilities is to ensure that there is a fair and equitable distribution of social sector housing right across this province. And like him, I suppose then I would be uh, favourably disposed to ensuring that that also includes Fermanagh South Tyrone. And uh, I think the member is trying to uh, dance on a pinhead here. But if he wants to talk to me uh, about this issue, then my door is open and he's welcome to come and discuss it with me. I call Judith Cochran. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, can I ask the Minister to provide an update on how his department intends to progress the Belfast Streets Ahead Phase 3 public REM improvement project? Yes, uh, Deputy Speaker. The, uh, my department submitted a planning application in April 2015 for the Belfast Streets Ahead Phase 3 project, which received approval from Belfast Planning Office in November 2015. Subject to additional approvals, economic appraisal and traffic regulations order, and funding, the construction stage of the Phase 3 project will take place from early 2017 to mid-2019. Furthermore, my department continues to work closely with Belfast City Council and the Department for Regional Development to plan for the successful delivery of this phase of the programme by the summer of 2018. And can I also say that the estimated cost of the project is around £32 million over four years, and my officials are in discussion with Belfast City Council about the potential for a contribution towards the cost of the scheme. £5 million has been agreed in principle, but this is subject to committee ratification following the outcome of the competitive tender. I call Judith Cochran. Um, thank you, um, and I thank the Minister um, for his answer. Uh, and I know that there will be some who uh, will criticise why the focus um, is often on Belfast City Centre itself. Can the Minister explain the rationale for continuing to invest in Belfast City Centre? Uh, Deputy Speaker, I, I thank the member for her question. Yes, and, and I think that uh, when she maybe hears the answer, she will agree with me that there is good rationale uh, for that. But a report by uh, TLT, a top 50 UK law firm, has highlighted untapped potential for retailers here in Northern Ireland, placing us among the top three regions with the greatest opportunities for development. Belfast is the main retail centre here, and the enhancements to the public realm in the city centre delivered through the Belfast Streets Ahead programme have attracted new businesses and investment to the city centre. And it is important that we continue to build on this. Furthermore, in addition, the £3 million Bank Square regeneration project has now been completed, and we are already seeing the positive benefits of our investment in this area. With the recent announcement of plans for new boutique hotel on Bank Street and the regular use of the square for performance exhibitions and folk town artisan market. I call Anna Lou. 
Thank you, Mr. Deputy Chair. Uh, coming from the voluntary and community sector, I'm very aware of the valuable work uh, the sector has done for Northern Ireland, but yet their budgets have been severely cut in recent years by various departments. I would like to know what is the Minister doing to ensure when we have the new departments that their role, that the voluntary community sector's role is enhanced? Uh, Deputy Speaker, maybe it would be appropriate at this time that uh, I understand that Anna Lowe will not be seeking uh, re-election to this House. And I think that uh, I would want to wish her well. I had uh, the honour or the privilege of serving under her when she, as she still is, the chairman of the Environment Committee. And despite sometimes differing on issues, I think that we've struck up a good workman-like uh, relationship and uh, just got on with things. And I acknowledge the great work that she's done. And I wish her well in the future. And I suppose, and sometimes we might even say this place will not be the same without her. So uh, all the best uh, to you, Ms Lowe. In relation to the question, yes, the voluntary sector, I think, are a very important and vital uh, sector in, in relation to Northern Ireland. It would not be my desire that the voluntary sector would indeed be made smaller. Indeed, I think there's going to be the potential for it to play even a greater role in the affairs of this province in the days ahead. However, I do have to say that with the incoming new department and the new executive and the new minister and the new intake of assembly members, I have to be truthful and say to you that will be strictly a matter for the new minister and the new department. I call Anna Lowe. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank you, Deputy uh, Speaker. And I want to thank uh, the minister's kind words. And certainly, uh, I want to thank him too for his always very uh, valuable contribution to the Environment Committee and we definitely we had very good working relationship uh, together. Um, when, when the voluntary sector is being cut, I think the role of volunteers um, is even more important than ever before. Will the Minister support the development of policy on active citizenship and volunteering? Deputy Speaker, yes, I think I would. I'm quite happy to stay on as short as that. <laughs> I call Peter Weir. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'd like, first of all, to thank the Minister for his work as DSD Minister and what will be his last question time before the election. Can I ask the Minister, appropriately as we're uh, the week after International Women's Day, does the Minister agree that uh, women have been adversely affected by the acceleration in state pension age increase? Uh, well, I thank the member for his question, and I, I believe you are referring to the, the recent media coverage which criticised the government for failing to inform women that their state pension age had changed despite the original legislation having been enacted in 1995. While it is unfortunate that some women appear to have been unaware of the change to their state pension age, we must recognise that reform is necessary to ensure our pension system remains affordable and sustainable in the future. When the timetable for increasing state pension age was revised in 2012, the original proposal was to increase pension age to 66 by April 2020. This would have meant some women would have seen their pension age delayed by up to two years. The proposal was subsequently revised, delaying the increase to 66 to October 2020. This was specifically designed as an easement for those women worse affected by the change. The maximum delay is therefore reduced to 18 months. I call Peter Weir. I thank uh, the Minister for his answer. I um, would ask the, seek the Minister's views. He mentioned about the change in terms of the dates uh, for the increase of pension dates to 66 from April 2020 to October 2020. Does he believe that was a, a cosmetic change by the government? 
No, I think there was a real good reason why it was, and I know that the, the member is not speaking here from a personal point of view, and that it's not, his, it's not in relation to his own. But I do want to have another look at that one, and I will come back to the member on it. Deputy Speaker, should I just say that before I sit down, it was remiss of me to also not acknowledge that uh, Judith Cochran will not be returning here, and, and I, I've always found Judith to be very affable, amenable, and helpful, encouraging, and sometimes very educational to talk to. Thank you very much. I call Claire Sugden. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, I was contacted by the Causeway Volunteer Centre last week saying, uh, to tell me that their core funding has been cut by a further 5.7%, which represents a 40% cut since 2011. How can the uh, Minister justify uh, this decision based on his comments even to Ms Lowe just a few minutes ago? <laughs> Deputy Speaker, I seldom try to uh, justify cuts. But sometimes I have it to do because I can't tell the member who asked the question most sincerely. I can tell the member, Deputy Speaker, that my budget has been cut severely. Uh, that was not of my making. That was not what I desired. However, I have to live within budget restraints. And again, if the member, if there's an organisation or a group within her area that she is particularly concerned about, I would urge her to come and call at room 132. Tell us about it. If there's something that we can be doing, let's hear it, and we'll make an honest attempt to do something. I call Claire Sugden. Um, I appreciate the Minister's comments, and I also appreciate that his budget has been cut. However, sometimes I think we're pulling the rug from beneath ourselves by cutting the likes of the community and voluntary sector, where they could be, where if we included them within our public service sector, we would make great savings. So has the Minister considered within his department how he can use the community and voluntary sector so that we can actually save money instead of making further cuts? Deputy Speaker, I think the member makes a, a very salient point. I think it's a good point that, in fact, the voluntary sector, in reality, does often save money. And that point is not missed. And indeed, whenever it comes down to funding uh, the voluntary sector, that is one of the, the, the issues that is analysed and carefully considered. Because I believe, as I've said to others, and I mean this sincerely, they do play a vital role in the different communities in which they're based. And I suspect that the one that the member speaks about, or maybe there's more than one, that is no different at all. And I can assure that that is very much taken into consideration. I call Adrian McCullen. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Could the Minister give me an update on the public realm scheme in Port Rush? Uh, yes, I, I think I can, if I can pick it up here. But in relation to the public realm scheme in Port Rush. In 2011, Coal Rain Borough Council commissioned a feasibility study, which determined that it was technically possible to extend and pontoon Port Rush Harbour to create a marina with up to 220 berths at a potential cost of between 10 and 14 million pounds. In June 2015, a further piece of work was commissioned to determine if other value for work money development options were possible. It is anticipated that additional work will be completed by the 31st of March 2016. A master plan to explore development opportunities for the development of the landslide side of the harbour is expected to commence in the summer of 2016. In addition to this, my department has committed a half a million pounds from its capital budget in 2016-17 to allow design work to commence on a public realm scheme for Port Rush and the redevelopment of Port Rush train station. These projects are time critical and this work is essential in the capital build elements to be completed before the Open Championship in 2019. My department has also provided the funding for £1.5 million of public realm scheme in Port Stewart. This scheme is underway and will complete by the end of May 2016. I call Adrian McCullough. Thank the Minister for that answer. And he sort of uh, pre preempted my supplementary question. For I was wanting to ask him could it be definitive as the start date for the, the Port Rice scheme, and also could he guarantee me that it would be finished for the Open Gulf? Uh, Deputy Speaker, I will be definitive. And uh, I will give the uh, member an assurance that every determined effort will be made to ensure that Port Rush is looking very slick when this uh, important event comes along in 2019, and I think the member can go back to Portrush tomorrow and tell everybody that. 
And that is the end of our time for questions to the Minister of Social Development. And we now move on.